A hike through the woods is a great way to clear your head after a stressful work week. Just don't be too surprised when you're joined by an eight-foot dog man who also had a rough week. Hunting hikers is monotonous business, you know. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters, the podcast where your terrifying encounters with the unexplained are narrated. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails if you want to see me simp for Ripley from the best alien film, well, Alien. Today I've got a new set of allegedly true and terrifying stories about disturbing things seen while hiking. Enjoy, and be sure to tell me your unexplained encounters at darkstories.org so I can narrate them on the show. Also, go to eeriecast.com for more free, scary podcasts like this, and to sign up to our newsletter to stay up to date on things like my cryptid card battling game. Now, let's begin. My First Time Out of State From Anonymous Princess 669 I was 22 years old when this happened. I had never been out of my home state before. But the Rona was raging at the time, and my friends never really took the pandemic seriously. That being said, we decided to take a trip. It was spur of the moment, and I was ecstatic. For privacy reasons, I won't use our real names. But there were four of us. Mike, Brittany, Taylor, and myself, Raven. Now the group was all into the weird stuff. Paranormal phenomena, cryptids, demonology, all of it. I personally have been actively practicing the craft since 13. That being said, take this story as you wish. But the trauma from it was all too real. Our destination was Point Place, West Virginia. Then we would travel through to Pennsylvania. We visited the Mothman Museum and everyone was genuinely having a great time. The next day, a few locals mentioned the abandoned bunkers on trails just off a back road. Curious, we went out there during the day. We spent hours howling, hiking, taking photos, and yes, we even took part in spray painting our names in one of the bunkers. Typical tourist stuff. Nothing out of the ordinary, yet. One portion of the woods, however, near the trail made me feel a bit on edge. Later in the day, we returned to our hotel and decided after dinner, we wanted the entire experience, so we would go back to the trails late at night. When we did, the wildlife was so lively. The frogs, the bugs, the wind, and my god, the heat. We went to a different spot than before. The woods along the trail was much thicker there than earlier. Realizing we'd need a machete of some sort to even attempt getting through it, we decided best to stay on the trail itself. We gathered our flashlights while Mike and Taylor went ahead, beginning to look for anything to catch our interest. Meanwhile, Brittany and I started down the trail. From where we walked, we could still hear the boys. Taylor was always loud, but we could hear them exclaiming as they had come across what appeared to be a summoning or sacrificial circle. I kid you not, there were candles, wax, and what appeared to be blood, all these things covering the floors inside the bunker. We hollered that we wanted no part of it, and continued walking along the trail. As interesting as it sounded, neither of us really wanted any part of that, or any attention brought to us if they did conjure anything or happen upon any strange people. The boys slowly caught back up with us, and we all kept talking and walking. It was just casual conversation, jokes, and fun. As we made our way farther down the trail, there was a weird quiet, an eerie silence. We all noticed and stopped to look around. Brittany and Taylor both being hunters and myself being raised by a hunter, we all knew that this type of silence in the middle of the woods was something you didn't want to ignore. Mike then turned to us. He was about 10 feet ahead of the group. Suddenly, from about 30 feet into the heavily wooded forest, we heard Mike's voice holler to us. But we were all looking at him right in front of us, just a few feet ahead. When that voice came, 
His mouth never moved. I began to panic then, my heart racing. I wanted nothing more than to run back to the van, and so I did. As I began to run, Taylor by my side, we saw what appeared to be a light of some sort, with sounds of something moving through the woods towards the trail accompanying it. I did not stay to find out what it was. Taylor, Brittany, and I booked it to the van, but Mike lagged behind. Maybe curiosity got the better of him, but he never saw what came out of those woods either. Not a single one of us saw what it was that mimicked his voice. To this day, no explanation was offered. Mike was upset because he wanted to be a witness to whatever this may have been, but the immediate fight or flight response I had reminded me that it may have been for the best of us that we didn't make contact with it. Fast forward a few days, we'd spent our time with no further events in West Virginia. We just admired its beauty and nearly died from the heat, really. When we finally arrived in Pennsylvania, we decided a hotel for the first night was best. Taylor, Mike, and I grabbed our bags while Brittany checked us in. As we were talking, Taylor, being the newest to the cryptozoology thing, decided it would be funny to scream, Hey, Wendigo! After I'd finished explaining the importance of never speaking its name, for what seemed like the millionth time, I looked at him, not sure if I was disgusted or terrified. And of course, our hotel room was on the bottom floor with a window right towards the woods, near the parking lot. Needless to say, I barely slept that night, although nothing happened then. The next day, we set up camp in a beautiful location, where there was a vast and cold river. The forest was alive that night and singing. We'd certainly hit the jackpot on locations to make a temporary home. We found state land our second day there, and decided we would go for a hike. Now, here I feel like a little history would be helpful. Mike and Brittany had been together for many years. Brittany has a lot of health issues, crippling anxiety, but she's a good person. Mike was an outdoorsman, cryptid-obsessed, brave, curious, and most importantly, bullheaded. Taylor and I have known each other for 11 or so years now, and he's been my best friend for four long years. We did everything together. And we've now been dating for almost a year. Needless to say, I know him like the back of my hand. I've known Brittany and Mike for quite some time too, and introduced them to Taylor. Now, with all that being said, we had ventured out into the thick forest and began to hike up this mountain. We had walkie-talkies for contact as we split into two parties. Taylor and I taking the right side of the mountain, while Brittany and Mike took the left. We decided to meet up in the middle at this small creek after making our way up. It wasn't long before I noticed that the woods felt heavy. There was an uncomfortable feeling as we walked, and we soon stumbled across another deafening silence. The birds had stopped chirping, and nothing in those woods seemed to even take a breath. This quiet was shattered when our walkie-talkies went off, making both Taylor and myself jump. The voice that came through was Mike's. Uh, just checking in. We're almost at the creek. You guys seen anything yet? Now, keep in mind we weren't looking for anything specific, nor special. Just half-heartedly cryptid hunting. We were mostly just keeping an eye out for souvenirs or memorabilia from the trip. We responded quickly. Nah, nothing yet. We'll be there in about five minutes. The slope was getting steeper as we finally met up. Brittany had sat down and told us she couldn't go farther up. Her hip was causing her too much pain. I decided I would stay behind with her. The boys wanted more adventure, so we said our goodbyes and asked they check in every few minutes or so. As the boys ventured forward, Brittany and I sat and talked. The discussion was nothing too exciting, just discussing what we were going to have for dinner, as we both had rumbling tummies. Suddenly, from not far off, we heard what could best be described as a buck grunting or huffing. This loud breathing resembled a snort. We looked around, but we didn't see anything. 
We decided we should check in with the boys, then head back to the van. When we did, we learned apparently that Taylor and Mike had separated. Mike was heading for the top, and Taylor followed the creek, which took a left turn heading into a lake. Once back at the van, Brittany and I sat and listened to the forest singing her song. We soaked up some sun while snacking on some fruit we'd brought. Suddenly, my walkie-talkie went off. It was Taylor this time. Hey, there is a tree down, and what looks to be clothes torn up. Weird, right? I responded. Probably best to leave it alone. Might be a homeless person's belongings. The time seemed to drag on, although only 20 minutes had passed. Suddenly, my heart began to race. I started to breathe heavily, and the woods around the van had gone quiet again. I stepped out of the vehicle, and I began to look around. Brittany immediately grabbed the walkie-talkie, asking for a check-in, but she received only radio silence. We then heard someone running, and I mean hightailing it, right towards the van. I stared in disbelief as Taylor came bursting through the tree line. His skin was shining with sweat, and he was heaving as he tried to breathe. He then ran towards me, and he couldn't catch his breath. He was breathing so fast, he suddenly bent over and threw up on the ground. When he finally calmed down enough for him to speak, the story he gave was chilling to say the least. He'd been walking up the creek until he came across the lake or pond. He saw a few people across the water, and they waved, but they didn't pay much mind to one another. He then headed back into the woods and he started back down the way he came. Suddenly, from his right, he heard a voice. My voice. He said I sounded weird, saying it sounded like me, but it was so emotionless, and it made his blood run cold. Taylor, come here. The voice called, but to his surprise, there was nothing he could see. Taylor. The voice repeated, almost like it was taunting him. He suddenly felt the need to run, everything in his body telling him to just hightail it. He ran full speed down the mountain, and when he stopped for a moment, he realized he didn't know where he was. The woods were silent. You could even hear a pin drop. He frantically looked around when suddenly he heard a loud twig snap behind him. He booked it again, running blindly in no particular direction, other than down the mountain. When he finally made it through the tree line and back to the van, he saw me at the van, and his panic had fully set in. The forest around us sparked to life again, moments after he came running out, as if to tell us whatever that was, was no longer there. I tried everything in my power to help him calm down, until we all made the uncomfortable realization that Mike had not come back yet. We radioed in, nothing. Brittany, who was now getting more worried, radioed again and again until finally Mike responded. He let us know that he was almost back to the van. He was on the left side of the mountain from us. He came walking out soon enough, blissfully unaware of what had happened. He was just excited about the new sights he'd seen. We got out of there quickly. Taylor lay across my lap in the back seat. Now here's where the history portion felt necessary. Knowing Taylor like I do, it's crucial to understand that nothing makes him cry. It's difficult to get emotions out of him at all, and usually he hides his fear quite well. But at the moment, he was shaking like a leaf and genuinely could not be consoled. None of us knew what actually happened out there, or what had been targeting Taylor. I'm 24 now, and I still have to console him some nights because of his nightmares from that day. Nightmares about a beast. He can see nothing but antlers. It chases him, grabs his leg, slams his body against a tree, and then he wakes up. And every time he wakes up from this dream, his body is shaking, and he's absolutely terrified. Take this experience as you wish, but please remember, 
If you go out looking, you may just find what you're looking for. And never, never say the name. It only takes one time to draw its attention to you. Visit in the Woods From Hunter L. The woods can be a very scary place. I know this well. I adore being out in the woods during hunting season. I've seen and heard some creepy things in the woods, but there's something different about this particular instance. Hunting season was just over a month ago now as of writing this, but this experience has literally changed my life. I'd been sitting in a ground blind in a part of the woods that branched out from the wood line, a small patch of wooded area that reached out about halfway between the rest of the wood line and the road, with a field on either side. Behind me was a swale, which is a sunken port of marshy bit of land, for those who don't know. And to my left, about twenty yards or so, was a bit of a ravine, about five feet deep, with a creek running through the bottom of it, and an easy slope down to the bottom. This ravine was parallel to the north wall of my blind, but then curved slightly and would flatten out a bit more to the east. My blind was maybe a third of the way from the woodland to the end of this, well, we'll call it a finger of the woods. My blind is octagonal and has four windows, little flaps with latches to keep them up in the closed position. It was situated such that every window faced a cardinal direction. Primarily, I was sitting facing eastward farther into the woods, with the road directly behind me a good 130 yards back or so. The door to enter the blind was behind me and to my left. By this point, the wind had picked up and was blowing from the north, so I had closed that window and always kept the window facing the road closed, for obvious firearm safety reasons. After sitting in that blind for about two hours that morning, without so much as a squirrel sighting, I began to hear these footsteps. I think that's what they were. Leaves crunching from something and all that. It was behind me, slightly to the left. This struck me as a little odd, because it sounded too close, like I should have been hearing it much sooner than that. I figured it must have been coming up from the swale behind me. That is a popular area for deer to bed down in so I got ready to shoot once it entered my vision. But I couldn't turn myself around, as that would make too much noise, and I'd have to open one or two windows, which would scare off the supposed deer. But this was not a deer. It sounded like human strides. They were a bit too heavy to be a deer, too. I wasn't immediately concerned. I guessed my father had come to check on me or something like that. But then I realized... No, he absolutely would have called or texted me before making a hike from his blind to mine. Then I thought maybe another friend of ours who we frequently hunted with was coming to check the blind. I was right near his tree stand after all. I even wondered if this was the game warden who had been very active this season. Either way, the footsteps seemed to get right to the door of my blind, maybe four feet back from it. Assuming this was a person, I simply reached over and unlatched one of the windows to peek out that way, since opening the door to the blind was rather arduous. I would have had to open all the little latches in the dark. When I looked outside the blind window, I saw to my surprise absolutely nothing. There was no human, no animal, nothing standing where I'd heard those footsteps. Deciding I was simply freaking myself out over nothing, I closed the window again, and I got situated back in my chair. A few seconds later, the footsteps started again. They walked past the door and were directly to my left. They were clear as day. No question about it, something was moving outside my blind. I quickly reached over and opened the window again, quickly seeing no one, and even looking around on the ground thinking it might be a squirrel or even a chipmunk jumping through the leaves. But again, no person, no animal, nothing. I was shocked. I'd heard those footsteps clearer than ever. They had sounded no more than three feet away from me, 
I could have reached my arm out the window, swung it about a bit, and I would have been touching whatever was out there. How could I not see anything? Thoroughly spooked, I got chills and closed that window again, sitting back down and waiting. Sure enough, before long, the footsteps picked up again. They walked forward, but didn't go far enough that they entered my vision. They veered off to the left, away from me, heading northeast. I didn't even bother trying to look this time, not right away at least. After a few moments, I heard them begin down the slope into the ravine and walk right down to the creek at the base of it. I peeked out in that direction by leaning far forward in my blind, and I could see where they were coming from. But whatever this was would have been in the ravine, out of my sight. The footsteps got down to a particular section of the creek, stopped, and I never heard them again. In the moment, my mind was racing with thoughts like, what was that? Was it real? Is it still down there? But then I realized something. Roughly eight years ago, a friend of ours had passed away. An older man, the father of the friend I mentioned earlier, in fact, whose tree stand was nearby. After his passing, he was cremated, and we spread his ashes. We spread them in the very creek I'd heard the footsteps vanish in, the exact spot where the footsteps stopped. Suddenly, I knew exactly what I heard, who I heard. I knew the old hoot was checking who was in the blind. I'm sure he was happy to see the young blood, the new generation as he liked to call me, sitting in that blind, keeping the tradition going. Not all ghost experiences have to be scary or malicious. Some can even be comforting. For me, this one certainly was. One of actually a few weird things. From M. Hopper 1000. When I was about 11, maybe 12, my family and I moved out to the middle of some abandoned strip mines in rural Alabama. It was awesome, going swimming in quarries, lots of abandoned equipment and cliff faces to climb, caves and miles and miles of trails, and abandoned dirt roads used by the mines to explore. The trade-off was there were a lot of venomous snakes, and at night, it was dark. No street lights, just the occasional porch light, maybe every mile or so on the main road. One day in particular, my friend P and I were out on one of the dirt roads that went off to the side of the main mine road. We hadn't been down that road before, but it was like 10 a.m. on a bright summer day, so we figured, why not? We had gone maybe a mile down that road when we came to a left-hand turn. Beside that left-hand turn and alongside the road we were walking on was a small lake. We walked up to the lake, and we watched small frogs and a turtle swimming around. Around then, I caught movement across the lake. I saw a man then, he walked away from us heading up the hill. I poked my friend P and pointed it out. Who is that? Why is he out there? We were miles into the mine trails. No people anywhere, no houses nearby. We both stood up, and as soon as we got right on our feet, the man stopped walking. In a split second, he spun around and started to run right in our direction. We bolted, and I mean we ran like Forrest Gump. I looked back, and he was running faster than any person I'd ever seen. He covered the distance. He had to run down the hill and around the lake to get close to us, a route which was easily 300 yards, in seconds. P grabbed me and we jumped off the road into a ditch behind some bushes. We hid ourselves. I peeked out and he was maybe 30 to 40 feet from us then, spinning around in the road. He was making this god-awful grunting sound. And, weirdly enough, I swear he had an entire cooked chicken in his hand. He was wearing absolutely tattered and destroyed overalls, 
dirty boots, and he had what I can only describe as a Cro-Magnon brow, a huge brow. Now, my memory might not be super accurate, given how long it's been, but it seemed like his forehead stuck out a good several inches over his eyes. He was the scariest thing I'd ever seen. He kept spinning around in the road and started running back the way he came. The two of us stayed there in that ditch for nearly an hour, afraid to move. We just listened, watching, in case he was hiding and waiting for us. Eventually, when it felt safe to do so, we crawled along the roadside, all the way back to the main road. From there, we walked, but stayed in the tree line until we saw the main paved road. Then we ran, running all the way back home. We got home, told our fathers, and both of our fathers and P's older brothers loaded up and went looking for him. But they never found a thing. All these years later, and it still haunts me. Now, my girlfriend recently took me out to her grandmother's house to meet and spend time with her family. And where does dear old granny live? Well, right on the edge of those same strip mines. I told her the story, and she looked really serious, saying, Y'all are lucky. There's all kinds of bad things that happen in those mines. So yeah, every visit to grandma means the Glock and the 12-gauge ride with us. That's my creepy encounter story. Update. I forgot to mention this until I was telling my dad about writing about this story on Reddit. He reminded me of something. I got beaten up really badly my last day of summer school. So to make me feel better, and for passing summer school, my parents bought me a Kawasaki motocross bike. My dad had an old Honda racing bike, so we tried to ride out there any chance we got. One day we were out deep in the mines, and I saw a wooden crate or box off the road in the bushes. It looked about six feet long, maybe 18 inches high. Me being a nosy kid, I walked over and looked inside. There was a ton of hay, a blanket, and an old pillow. I called my dad over and showed it to him. I remember him looking around, and he said to me, If someone's living in that, way out here, they don't want to be found or bothered. Let's go home. So we hopped on the bikes, rode home, no problems at all. But the weird thing was, my dad sat out on the front porch with the light off most of the night, just staring at the edge of the woods. He never explained why, and I can't believe I never put these two incidents together, but now I think I know. Apparently, he never saw anything or anyone, because he came in late that night, went to bed, and never sat out there again. Secret Shack in the Park From Weston Kenyon The following happened to me while I was hiking in Branson, Missouri. Those familiar with the area can speculate as to precisely where it occurred, but I won't state it explicitly here because I don't want anyone else messing around there due to what ended up happening. I'm an avid hiker, and I love to walk outside on new trails. I'd been visiting this particular network of trails for the past year, and I had one unexplored trail left to hit. That's where my weird sighting took place. It was February 2023, just a couple of days ago as I write this. I managed to find the trailhead and navigate this unfamiliar terrain with great ease. Right before I got to the end, I noticed something in the woods ahead. From this distance, it looked like a large camping backpack. Upon further examination, it turned out that was not at all what it was. It was a large section of fake rock wall made with styrofoam or some similar material. I shrugged it off and followed the trail of trash down the side of the ridge. There were household items scattered everywhere. At one point, I found a whiskey flask and two drug needles. 
I was traveling off into the woods in the opposite direction of the end of the trail, curious as to why all this stuff was here. It was a very steep valley down to a river. I soon noticed something ahead and went up as close to it as I dared. It was a collapsed shack. I was standing on a rocky ledge looking down at the remains of it with no way to get to them except if I were to climb down the rock face, which I wasn't going to bother with. The cabin appeared to have been jerry-built out of sheet metal and the walls were fallen in on each other. There were tons of household items in and around the wreckage, most of which seemed to be old food products. A few trees were on top of the debris, but the odd thing was that I could tell by the stumps that they had been cut down as opposed to having naturally fallen down. The trees below the shack, as it was overhanging the ridge, appeared to have been chopped down as well. They were leaning hard forward, at least. I couldn't really make sense of it all. This was public land for hiking. Why did someone build a cabin here? And even more so, why did they cut trees down on top of it? I couldn't tell whether the trees had caused the structure to cave in, or if they were cut down after the fact. I took a couple of photos with my phone and stared down at the gloomy site. Then, I was startled when I saw movement below the cabin. Through the collapsed trees and fallen walls, I could see two large legs moving about. For some reason, my first thought was Bigfoot. I took my phone back out and began to film it. The figure crashed around loudly. I couldn't make out anything distinct. I couldn't tell whether it was a person or an animal. I heard it clearly but couldn't see much of it, just a dark blur of movement. I was beginning to think maybe it was a deer. That was until I saw the large shape of a person coming into sight. I thought they were coming my way. I didn't know who they were and what they were doing, but I began to run away, back up the hill. I feared it was some druggy or homeless person or both, I ran to the trail and sat down to catch my breath. Once I'd rested a bit, I went back. I was even more curious now. I mean, what was this person doing? And why were they below the shack and the trees that were leaning on it? That seemed pretty dangerous to me. The whole thing could come down on top of them. I crawled down from a different angle to try and get a glimpse of this person. They were making a lot of noise. If they had seen me, they showed no sign of it. Suddenly, I heard a cough, which confirmed it was indeed human. It sounded as though they were building something. I then began to hear banging sounds and dragging sheet metal. I went down the ridge off to one side of the shack to try to reach where I estimated the person was. I could see more, but still not enough. I couldn't tell where they were most of the time. All I heard was stuff being moved and stacked, as well as hammering sounds. But it didn't sound like they were actually using a hammer. It sounded like wood hitting wood. Eventually, I was too sketched out and left. The most I ever saw of them was black pants and possibly a red coat. I never saw enough of them. I decided to leave before they noticed me and potentially came after me. As to what they were doing, I had some ideas. Perhaps it was a homeless guy building a shelter from the old cabin parts. Maybe it was park personnel clearing another trail because I noticed a bunch of trees and brush had been cut down in a trail-like formation. I still don't know. Maybe I never will. All I do know is that I didn't have a good feeling about it, and I just had to leave. I posted the picture I took of the shack remains, if you want to take a look. I don't think you can see the person, but I haven't analyzed it or anything. Narrator's note, the link to that picture will be in the description. Update I have an update now as of four days later, and it's not comforting. My brother and I returned to that site after I had told him and my other brothers about what happened. The fake rock wall thing was pushed over now and farther down the ravine, so I know someone had been there. We found a cap and a tote bag from Silver Dollar City, which is an amusement park in the Branson area. We also found sweatpants, which was a little weird. We ventured down to the cabin remains and I compared my photo to it. 
The debris was slightly rearranged. Someone had moved things. We stared at it, trying to decide whether to go down and check it out or not. Keep in mind that it was rapidly getting dark at this point. My thought was it wouldn't be worth going down for because it would be dark by then and we wouldn't be able to see anything. But my brother found this appealing, saying it would be pretty cool and creepy if we did go down in the dark. We do like the adrenaline of scary stories and always wanted something to happen when we were out hiking. That day, something did. We listened in silence for a while to be sure no one was there. We only heard birds and squirrels rustling about. My brother thought it best to call out and alert any one of our presence so we wouldn't be taking them by surprise. We shouted something sporadically as we began to descend. I even yelled out, Do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? As a reference to Mr. Ballin. We were mostly joking around, singing songs, talking about skinwalkers. We paused to listen atop a steep rock section. I heard water trickling down that I didn't hear before. I shrugged it off as water running off the rocks. We cautiously continued down, and it was pretty dark at this point. I'd grabbed a heavy glass vodka bottle as a weapon, and my brother packed a ping pong paddle looking rock. We came across a chair that was upside down on top of a log. We'd passed the ruins now, and stopped to hunch down and peer across to where the man was before. I froze. Far below the collapsed structure, tucked in the ridge amidst the trees, there was a newly built shack. We were now parallel to it. It was bright white, I assume made of sheet metal. This confirmed that he had been building something else the other day. Now I was sketched out. We were thinking that no one could possibly be living in that wreckage. But now knowing there's a whole other shack built below it opened up the possibility that someone was there, and they had to be inside right now. Then I saw a dark shadow against the white wall of the shack, I think it was a tree stump, because it never moved, so I called out, Hello? Hello? No one replied. I was starting to get a bad feeling about this, so I declared that we would go a little farther and get a better view of the new shack, then leave. It was pitch black by then. My brother had his phone light on. I had started filming on my phone. We crept a little farther and crouched down. We didn't hear anything, and we didn't see any light from that cabin. We were still talking softly. Our discussion leaned into skinwalkers again, half hoping to see one. That's the kind of people we were. As I tried to secure my footing on the steep hill, we heard a firm voice from inside the structure. Y'all better get out of here before you get shot. That was all we needed. Casually, I called out, Okay, okay. Well, we're, leaving. we're leaving to de-escalate. My brother had already begun clamoring back up the ridge. As I followed, I asked out, Is this, Is this private, private property? property? No response. We booked it, clawing at the mud and scraping our knuckles and knees on rocks. It was a difficult climb, and we kept slipping down. I glanced at the bottle in my hand, thinking, screw it, and tossed it aside so I had at least one hand to climb with, since I was still filming with the other. We had to get out of there before he came out of the shack, which he thankfully never did. I could hear no pursuit behind us, so I wasn't too worried about being shot at. We came to the steep rock part, and my brother had a little trouble getting up. I had more trouble. Finally, I set my phone down on top and climbed up, slipping in the process. I picked up my phone and we scrambled up and out onto the trail. We then left it and came out in town. We talked about the adventure as we walked the sidewalk back to the car. My brother speculated that he had probably been bluffing about shooting us, which was probably true, but I wasn't about to find out. The main objective was to get out, and the mission in the first place was to see what was down there and that mission was complete. That shack looked rather well built although I could barely see in the dark. It was parkland, and I couldn't imagine someone who wasn't homeless sleeping out there. 
I think it was a homeless guy who built a shelter. It was a very dangerous spot to build one, however. And I could tell he did not want to give away his presence until he absolutely had to. I'm not planning on going back. I just wonder what he was doing out there that would have been worth shooting some hikers for. The Wendigo that attacked me and my dog from James M. B. I am a horror fan. I've been listening to this podcast for many years, and I've been wanting to post a story myself. Now, recently, I've experienced something that I will truly never, never forget. I'm a 43-year-old man, 6 foot 4, with a good build, and I live in California. I'm an avid hiker and walker, going everywhere with my wife, my 2-year-old, and my 110-pound Central Asian Shepherd puppy, Okya. This started when I decided to take a hike at around 8 p.m. one night. My wife was tired after a long day's work. I was tired too. I had a tough day at the office that day. I had nearly got into a fight with another coworker, actually. However, there was this trail that was said to be extremely beautiful under the stars in the night sky, and I found things like this very relaxing and calming. I decided to take Okia and my 44 Magnum for safekeeping with me, as recently, crime rates had gone up where I lived. I drove up to the trail, and I started on my walk with my dog, who was curiously sniffing around the rocks and bushes. We were around halfway through our hike, when Okia stopped to do his business. I waited for him. That's when I began to hear leaves crunching. I then heard a voice whisper, Over here. Now, I practice kickboxing, so I'd like to say I can defend myself against most attackers. So, as I turned, ready to face whoever this was, Okia barked once loudly, then dashed off right into where the noise came from. He jumped into the forest next to the trail. I screamed out his name and ran after him. I jumped into the tree line and dashed. I ran through brambles and bushes calling out, Okia! Yeah. That's when I bumped into something. Hard. I fell to the ground, getting mud all over my new sports pants. I managed to pick myself up quickly. But then, I froze. There, in front of me, there was some kind of thing. I couldn't take my eyes off of it. This thing looked similar to the SCP-096 Shy Guy, except with a bigger frame, longer arms, and longer legs. I swear it had to have been at least ten feet tall. Its skin was stretched and pale. Its eyes were blank and white. It was drooling and slobbering from its mouth, blood smeared over its lips. I was speechless absolutely stone cold with terror. I was only able to utter three words. What the heck? Its mouth opened then, and it let out a horrifying shriek. It sounded like the mix of a man being murdered, a bear's roar, and a wolf's howl. I scrambled a few steps back then, in utter shock, and whispered the three same words again. What the heck? Then it just looked at me, straight in my eyes. It fell to four legs and ran. It advanced up to me in the blink of an eye. I pulled out my magnum as fast as I could and fired off two shots. I think the first smashed into its chest, causing the thing to scream. The second knocked it down. However, it just got back up crimson liquid coming out of its huge body, and it started to run once more. That's when I realized it had long been time to get the heck out of there. I ran and ran, screaming for anyone to help me. I heard twigs snapping and bushes being trampled behind me. I turned around and fired again, but the thing continued on my heels, and somehow it was taking these bullets like pebbles. This is what scared me the most. 
I couldn't help but wonder, how strong is this thing? What is it? If something like this is real, why has it never appeared in footage somewhere? But there was no time left to wonder these things. It was drooling out of its mouth, spit and blood flying all over. It was probably running about twice as fast as I could. Then, like in some cliched horror film, I tripped over a rock. I fell, smashing my head on the ground. I turned and tried to get up, but I couldn't. I twisted my ankle on the fall down. I watched this creature in pure fear as it jumped into the air, launching itself towards me like a panther. Suddenly, there was a loud, smashing sound. In the blink of an eye, Okia smashed his full frame into the thing's head. My dog crawled on top of it, starting to tear at it, biting at its skin, at its legs. It howled and yelled, trying to shake Okia off, but Okia would not let go. I got up, trying to land a shot on the thing again. I saw an opening, and I fired. It shrieked and shook. However, just as before, the thing took them like spitballs. That's when the flesh that my dog had been biting just sort of ripped off, sending Okia flying off of it. The creature screamed and yelled even more, trying to reach the spot where its flesh was now gone. It turned towards me, giving me a look of anger and hatred. It shrieked and sped towards me once more. I called my dog over as quickly as I could, and we both ran. All that adrenaline saved me from falling behind pushing me through the pain of my twisted ankle. We soon reached the outside of the tree line, and we began to speed our way down the trail. After what seemed to be a mile of running, I looked behind me and saw nothing. I sighed with relief and exhaustion. Then I heard it. The very same howl that thing had made before. We picked up our speed once more and reached the end of the trail. We hopped into my car and sped off, leaving behind a big puff of smoke and dust. I got home in a hurry, telling my wife the whole story, and she didn't believe me, of course. She thought I finished the hike, had went to the local pub, and had gotten drunk. But she did agree that I shouldn't take any more hikes or walks at night. She did want to know why Oka's mouth was bloody and why my ankle was bent up. She took me to the hospital that night, without me saying another word about it. Okia was fine, and I would be too, thankfully. For saving my life, I got Okia a big, juicy steak. To this day, I think that what I encountered was a Wendigo, and after looking it up online, it's scary to think about, because a lot of stories report these things coming home with the person, following them from their first encounter. But luckily, I haven't seen that thing since, and I hope I never will. I truly thank my dog for being there when I needed him. I've never gone back to that trail, and rarely take hikes anymore. When I do, I bring my dog and my gun, just in case I encounter anything like this again. Tent Camping Fright from Pleasant Peasant. This story is a little short, and I'm really just looking for someone who had the same experience as me. That year, it was the first night of spring break, and I decided to go tent camping with my dad in East Texas. I had a machete with me, and I wasn't feeling too uncomfortable. We set up camp, sat by the fire, and went to bed. Everything seemed normal, until later. I woke up at 12.30 to hear someone's dog barking frantically at something. This just pegged me as really annoying at first. We were trying to sleep after all. I also had one of the worst headaches I think I've ever had. A few minutes later, I realized the forest was silent except for that dog. I'm certainly not an avid camper, I've only camped twice before that, but even I was smart enough to know that that means there's a predator or something around. I was beginning to feel on edge then, and as I was trying to fall back to sleep, 
I heard something else. This sounded like a cross between a mountain lion, a woman, and a horse shrieking. While this repeated, my dad suddenly sat up, then passed out again. No wonder. I told him he shouldn't have had four beers. This went on and on about 20 seconds before it shut up. I know this wasn't a mountain lion. I've heard a few of those on previous camping trips. This sounded more unnatural than that. I tried to go back to sleep, and eventually I was successful. I woke up again at 3.15, hearing a rooster crow in the distance. Again, this was deeply annoying, and my head was pounding even worse now. While I was trying to fall asleep, again, there was another weird sound. At first, I was sure it was a donkey braying, but then the voice got really deep and sounded more like a smoker gasping for breath. I was just so confused and in so much pain that I couldn't think clearly. I stumbled out of the tent to relieve myself and to find some Advil that I had packed, but exiting the tent was not a smart move. It was drizzling then, this weird sort of thick rain that smelled metallic. That was weird too. As I was peeing on a tree, I heard rustling in the bushes from the direction I heard the demented donkey. I turned to look and noticed there was something like rotten raw deer meat on the ground. It was nearly a full moon, so it was very bright. Then it stumbled out of the bushes. I was looking at it, something that at first I thought was a man. It had pale gray skin with sunken eyes and no nose. It was limping along and didn't seem to notice me. But this definitely wasn't a man. I stood there petrified, hoping it would continue to ignore me. It bent like all the way into the ground and started just eating the rotten meat. Once it was finished, it turned back the way it came and limped back through the tree line. Honestly, at the time, I wasn't even scared. I was just in shock. I kept thinking, what is that, a zombie? Zombies aren't real, what on earth? But I really don't think it was a zombie now. I mean, I have zero idea of what this thing was, and now I'm asking everyone who reads or hears this to please give me your thoughts. I need closure. If you know of what any of these three peculiar things sound like, Please enlighten me, because I have a hunch they were all the same creature. Something is watching. From Anthony, 1997. My encounter took place about a year ago. My dad and I always go hunting on some land together, which has been in our family for a while. This land bunts up to Shiloh Battlefield State Park in Tennessee. The land has a lot of stories and legends to it. Supposedly, a medical tent was stationed there in the Civil War. Those woods always gave me weird feelings, like I was being watched. One day I got loaded up, grabbing my 30 odd six, and I went to get my dad to go hunting. However, he had gotten sick the night before and didn't feel like going. I loaded up in my 97 Camaro and headed to the old homestead. I got there around 5.30 a.m., proceeding to load my gun, heading out to the deer stand in the woods, about 100 yards or more in. As I said, the woods here have always creeped me out, like I was being watched, but that day was different. I kind of felt at ease. So I started walking. Halfway there, I heard these heavy footsteps. I stopped in my tracks and I listened. I heard them take two more steps, then stop. I looked around, but as it was 5.30 a.m., I couldn't make out anything out of the ordinary. I kept on walking then to the stand, making sure I kept my head on a swivel and my gun off safety, because panthers and mountain lions aren't scared to run up on you. I wanted to be sure I was ready if one did. I made it to the deer stand and opened the door and locked it behind me. 
I pulled up the chair to the window of the stand, and the woods seemed more alive than usual. The birds were chirping a lot, and squirrels were running across the front of the stand. I sat out there about half an hour. I didn't see a deer yet, nor had I heard anything of the sort. I got on Facebook Marketplace on my phone, looking at cars and trucks, when I noticed the woods went completely silent. No birds chirping, no crickets, no more squirrels moving about. It was so otherworldly. I put my phone back in my pocket and grabbed my gun. I sat up and began to look around. I wasn't able to make anything out just yet. I sat back again and I got back on my phone. Another 10 to 15 minutes went by. Suddenly, I heard a blood-curdling scream. I dropped my phone, I was so startled, and I grabbed my gun. I stood up, making sure I took in every little detail of the woods around me, making sure I didn't overlook a panther or mountain lion hiding in a tree or in a bush. After what felt like forever, I sat back again. I told myself it was my imagination. Then I got back on my phone, trying to calm down. But then, I heard my dad screaming my name. Anthony, Anthony get back here now. get back here now! My hair stood up on my neck. I turned and looked around. Nobody was there. I got on Life 360 and saw that dad was still at home. My heart now in my throat, I looked around slowly, more attentive. That's when I saw something out of the corner of my eye darting behind a bush. I stared at that bush for five to ten minutes before I slowly put my phone in my pocket, grabbed my rifle, and slowly unlocked the door to the stand. When I was about to open the door, I heard my dad's voice again. Hey, hey Anthony! Anthony. Come here. Come here. Look what I found, Look son. Found, son. My heart stopped. I don't know how long I stood there before I made my next move. I knew whatever it was talking to me was not my dad. So I took my rifle, and I fired a shot straight in the air. Then I took off running. I racked another one just to be safe. The whole time I'm running, I can hear it getting closer and closer until I burst out of the woods and threw my gun into my Camaro. I looked back, and when I saw the human-like creature, it stood seven or nine feet tall. It was extremely slim, with disproportionate legs bent the wrong way. It had pale, pasty skin that looked like it was rotting off. Where its eyes should have been were black holes, and it had an evil grin from ear to ear. I threw my Camaro into reverse, slinging gravel as I pulled out of the little drive. I haven't been back, and I don't know if I ever will go back, to hunt on that land. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an EerieCast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com, such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to EerieCast.com plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy. Because this world is a strange one.